All right, cool. So um, I'm here to talk about esoteric programming languages, um, which are called esolangs or esolangs, if you're the kind of person who says esoteric. Um, and essentially, they're programming languages that don't have any practical function. Um, they're languages that were developed as either technical experiments, um, parodies of existing languages, sometimes jokes. But um, there are others which be have become sort of explorations of how we communicate with machines, how computers teach us to think, um, and just generally how we respond to logical systems. Um, and so this is sort of you know, something that's built up over the years by hobbyists. Um, this kind of thriving subculture of programmers who have traded ideas online, um, really starting on, on IRC. They still have a very active uh, IRC channel. Um, this is just a quote from Cory Archangel about how hobbyists are the true heroes of contemporary computer art. Um, John Cates has also talked about uh, expert systems, um, communities uh, without institutional or academic support, but have sort of pushed each other deeper into a subject, uh, developing their own aesthetics and practices as a group. And that, that's really what's happened with, uh, with esoteric programming, um, as it has with like slash fiction and all sorts of other you know, genres of work that have developed online. So um, the first language that's generally considered uh, an esolang uh, is InterCal, which actually goes back to 1972. Um, it was created by two bored graduate students working early in the morning. Um, and it was really sort of a parody of languages of the time. Um, it, it, you know, it's obviously very unclear. It's very hard to understand what this, what this language is doing, what this program is doing. Um, but there's kind of a weird thing going on with the, um, all the begging, all the pleases. Um, please abstain from ignoring. Please don't ignore this. Please don't give up. Um, and what happens with InterCal is that uh, you know, ordinarily when you, when you compile a program, the compiler gives you some friendly feedback, you know, either that your program is compiled or that there's an error on line five or whatever. Um, InterCal doesn't tell you anything. Um, and there are various reasons, there are many reasons that your program might fail. Um, one of them is that you haven't begged the compiler enough, you haven't said please enough, so it finds you rude. But um, if you say please too much, it finds you simpering, and then it'll ignore it too. So, um, and of course, there's nothing in the documentation that tells you how much begging you have to do exactly, so you just kind of have to figure that out. Um, so I took this example code actually from a piece in Cabinet Magazine uh, by Lev Bradeshenko who um, talked explicitly about the kind of s &M aspect of this relationship with the compiler. Um, but so after InterCal, really not that much happened with SLANGs for about the next 20 years. Uh, and then all of a sudden in 1993, we had a, a bunch of sort of important languages emerge. Um, one of them is the most notorious programming language, uh, BrainFuck. So BrainFuck actually, it's a very simple language. Um, it only has eight commands. Um, and they're all written with punctuation. So, you know, for people who haven't done a lot of programming, these are all sort of directly mapping to assembly code, kind of the code behind the code. And ordinarily, um, the programming languages that you actually use make these easy for you. You'll have something you can say like, let x equal three. But what's happening behind the scenes is it's moving to somewhere in memory that's x and it's putting the value three into it. Um, BrainFuck exposes all this um, to you directly. And so there's no x. Um, you have to move the pointer left or right through memory, find a place that you can think of as x, and then have um, three plus signs to put the, the number three in, because everything's initialized to zero. Um, so what happens is, you know, it quickly gets very complicated. Like the rules are very simple. Um, and you can see this is different ways of representing numbers. You know, the first five, it's like, you know, it seems sort of intuitive. It's like scratching consecutive lines, um, like, to keep score in a card game or something. Um, but by the time you get up to 16, you don't really want to write 16 plus signs. So you have this looping structure where it's moving back and forth between two places in memory. Like it puts four in one memory, um, in one memory cell and then it moves over and it's um, adding four and then moving back to the left and subtracting one and it keeps doing this until one of them has zero and one of them has 16 in it. Um, and you can see all the different variations of, of writing the number 36. So it's this direct translation from assembly code without any concessions to human thought. Um, and you know, on some level, programming languages are the most direct conduit between human thought and, and machine logic. Uh, and because there are no concessions and no abstractions to help us along, BrainFuck really dramatizes this collision between human thinking and, and computer logic and this breakdown of communication. 
Um, and so the decision somebody makes to write the number 77, um, all of these are different ways of writing 77, um, becomes kind of a record of what the programmer was thinking. All these sort of very arbitrary decisions that ordinarily they don't have to make. Um, the numbers next to each of these is the number of uh, processor cycles it takes to, to write the number. Um, the first one is 24, and then how many uh, memory cells it uses to record the number. Um, and this is how you actually write hello world. So, you know, there's a lot of things. I mean, programming is very messy, and um, there's a lot that we build around it to sort of make it easy to understand naming conventions and coding standards and so on so that we can more easily understand what other programmers have written. And it pretends to be very orderly, but it, but it really isn't. And BrainFuck really just kind of cuts through all of that. Um, it makes everything just impossible to, to follow, um, but not in an artificial way, just by sort of exposing that code behind the code. Um, so one of the things that this reminds me of is work such as um, Solowitz and Complete Open Cubes. Um, so this, this is six of them. It's all these, these different variations of, of open cubes with various pieces missing. But what's interesting about it is that Lewitt doesn't want you to look at just six of them. He wants you to see all of them. Um, there, he doesn't want to summarize. He doesn't want to make the one piece that sort of implies the others. He wants to show you every single one. Um, and Rosalind Krauss, writing about Lewitt, um, sort of ex explained it in terms of um, talking to like a young child or an old person who um, his memory isn't very good, who wants to share every single little detail that they remember. And all these sort of um, details that all seem the same connected with and in this kind of this kind of way. So it's in the same way he's, he's showing every single one of them. It becomes a system of compulsion, of the obsessional's um, unwavering ritual, um, and all this precision and neatness that covers over this abyss of ir irrationality sitting behind it. And in the same way, BrainFuck, with its simple rules, takes us on this kind of ludicrous journey. But the interesting thing for BrainFuck, of course, is that it's the system of machine code exposed in a straightforward way um, to show how alien it can be from, from how we really think. So BrainFuck was this language which uh, inspired uh, like dozens of, of imitators. Um, and there, it almost became a rite of passage for people writing their first SLANG to write some variation of BrainFuck. Um, there's, there's one called OOK. Um, and so it's just the word OOK with different, different punctuation. But like, if it's a period and then a question mark, that corresponds to like the plus sign in, in, in BrainFuck. And if it's like two question marks in a row, it's, it's, um, it's one of the brackets. So this all just translates directly back to BrainFuck. Um, so this is the orangutan version. Um, there's the fish version as well. Um, but there's like dozens of these. Um, so another, another thing that, that um, BrainFuck ma makes me think of are these kind of art languages, especially the, the language Ua, which is um, a language which takes a short time to, to learn. Um, but the, the main thing about this language, first of all, it's all written in punctuation, like BrainFuck. So this is a spoken language. You use it to communicate with someone else. Um, but what happens is, there's, first of all, there's no consonants. It's all just strings of vowels. So it's already sort of difficult to understand what somebody is saying. But there's only a small vocabulary, and every word has many different meanings. So if you want to say, I love you, it means the same thing as, like, you flatten the sofa. Um, like, the, the word for language is the same as genocide. Um, so so what happens is it becomes this kind of like trippy idea art just by trying to have a conversation with somebody. You can have a long conversation with someone else before realizing that you're talking about two completely different things. And you're not, you know, you're not having the conversation you thought you were. Um, so to move on from BrainFuck, um, the language Malbolge. So this one, this one is a little harder to explain. This also has only eight instructions. Um, but this is the most difficult programming language yet to, to write code for. Um, no one has actually written a successful program by hand. Um, it's only been written by other software. Um, but you can see how short the Hello World program is. So you don't think it's like, OK, well, it's, you know, this doesn't look that complicated, really. You know? <laughs> well, what this is really doing is um, all these characters are translated into numbers. Um, but together, they're translated into 10-digit um, ternary numbers. So it's all base 3. And um, then, so then it's broken down, and the combination of the number and where it falls in the program uh, creates the command. And almost every command is ignored. There's only a few that actually do anything. Um, and what they do is stuff like rotate the value by one ternary digit. 
So you have to kind of figure out how to get the number you want in, in a way that it can, be, it can be translated this way to get a different number. It's, it's sort of, um, and almost everything is ignored. You can see this is uh, NOP means no operation. And any number that's not up here is considered a, a no operation. Um, it took two years before the first uh, Hello World program was written. Uh, and it was written with a, a beam search algorithm that just kind of treated the language as irrational and just tried every combination and did sort of a, um, uh, um, it basically treated it as a black box. And it just found programs that got closer and closer to Hello World until it was actually able to successfully write it to the screen. Um, so I've written my own language that's sort of inspired by the same kind of thinking, um, which is called entropy. And entropy is really kind of specifically about compulsion, um, about the way programmers try to get code perfect, which of course it never is. And the way that like, because we're often not very good at logic, we, we make up for it by like, adding the flavor of logic, of, of making things that sort of feel orderly, even though they're, they're broken. You know? um, so what happens to entropy, this is actually easy to write code in, in terms of um, you know, you're using, it, it sort of looks like C. So it's, the code actually looks sort of familiar. But what happens is all the data changes every time you use it. Um, it changes randomly, but it basically becomes in increasingly entropic. Um, this is what 99 bottles of beer on the wall looks like. You can see it starts off basically right, but the longer it goes, the more it sort of just becomes random Unicode characters. Because what's happening is every time you use a string, like the string bottles of beer on the wall, it shifts, each of the letters shift a little bit. Um, or they can shift randomly. By the time it gets down to 74, this is what you have. Um, and by the end, it's just like complete garbage, except for the no more bottles of beer on the wall, because <laughs> it's the first time you've written that. But, um, so basically, to get this idea across to non-programmers, um, I decided to write the classic chatbot Eliza in Entropy. And the reason I picked Eliza was because even though people know she's code, they ascribe the personality to her very quickly. And I was curious what personality Eliza would have in Entropy. And um, I ended up with Drunk Eliza. Um, so at first, she's basically saying the right things, but she like, increasingly slurs her words until it becomes nonsense. Um, so you can see here where she tells me, I understand you, fuck Lee, which became the name of my thesis. Um, but, but this is how it, it's usually displayed, is like green, green text on black, kind of this traditional. Um, but one thing that was sort of interesting is the way that people respond to Drunk Eliza. Like, you know, first of all, people tend to act in sort of a drunken way back towards her the, more, the longer she's ta they're talking to her. And they're sort of like just banging their fists on the keyboard. But I was a bit surprised by how many guys just hit on Eliza, <laughs> which is actually kind of a majority of the conversations that have happened on the site. I mean, this person's obviously being like a little over the top with it. But um, this actually isn't like that atypical. Um, so going back to, to 93 for a minute, um, Chris Pressey was, was very important to the That's Like community. He, he, um, for a while, his website uh, in the late 90s was sort of a meeting place for, for a lot of Esslingers. Uh, but anyway, he, he created um, a, a 2D language. So what happens is um, it actually it starts here, and the carrot kind of points this way, and then the V points down, and then it moves this way, and it moves this way. And so it, you know, this one, it just goes back and forth, but you can make it go any direction you want. So this is hello world, and all it's doing is it loads each character. So hello gets um, loaded uh, backwards. But it always spits it out backwards. It, it's off the top. It's a, a lipo. Um, so it goes back out this way. Um, and 48, I think, is just a comma, uh, the ASCII for a comma. Um, so yeah, so that's basically how that works. But, um, Anyway, so you know, in 2001, David Morgan Marr took the idea further, and he said, you know, we don't need text at all. Let's just do it with, with pixels. So he, you know, he made a language inspired by Mondrian. Um, the piece to the left is actually a Mondrian piece. The other two um, pieces up here are, are Piet programs. Um, and what happens is each kind of block of color is part of a command, and changes in hue and changes in brightness are um, together are interpreted as, as commands. Um, so this prints Piet to the screen, and that's a hello world in the middle. Um, and these are all sort of like individual pixels. Um, it, they're just blown up. Um, 
But what's kind of interesting about this for me, it's, it's almost like a kind of generative art, but it's not the computer generating the piece. It's, it's people pr producing something according to, according to these rules. Um, and an aesthetic uh, you know, comes out of this that isn't really that much like Mondrian. Like for me, you know, Mondrian wouldn't be using these, those types of colors, like that turquoise and, and stuff. Um, so I'm really much more interested in like, the piece in the middle, which kind of natively comes out of the language. Um, so, okay, so another thing that, that um, this type of work references, I want to talk for a minute about uh, event scores, about Flux's event scores. Um, so if people are familiar with, with Yoko Ono's cut piece. Um, so there were sort of a variety of different things that, that um, Flux's artists tried to do with, with event scores. Um, you know, with the cut piece, the description of the piece kind of contains the performance, but what actually comes out of it is very different than what you get from just reading the piece. You know, when she actually performs it, um, I mean, she's, she, there's a few different variations of this. Somewhere she, she says explicitly that the performer could be a, a man. But when she actually performs it um, as a woman, it, it becomes, there's all this kind of sexual violence to it that isn't sort of obvious in the description, but it's still sort of contained within the instructions for the score. And so uh, there are people who have compared um, computer programs to event scores. But of course, there's a difference because the computer doesn't, uh, the computer only interprets the code in a very literal way. Um, uh, Jeff Cox, in his book, uh, Speaking Code, um, points out that the program is a special kind of score, that a computer program undermines the distinction be between its function as a score and a performance of the score, that, program, that programs do what they say at the moment of saying it. So there's no level of interpretation. But with esoteric programming, the language can become a framework that allows an experience to happen. And now the programmer is the performer, kind of interpreting the language by writing code in it. Because um, one of the things that happens when you're learning a new language is you learn to think within it. And you learn the rules for the language. And it, and it kind of shapes the, the piece that you make. And it's by doing that, the programmer experiences the, um, the work of the, uh, an esoteric program. Um, so here's some more Piet programs. Um, but I want to mention this pi program by Richard Mitten. Um, this actually calculates pi um, by literally dividing the area of this circle by the radius. And so what happens is the larger you draw the program and the less pixelated the circle is, the more accurate pi gets. So it actually flattens the representation of the circle into the, it becomes the actual circle that it's using to do the calculations in the code. Um, so he's actually using the picture, instead of just sort of representing a whole bunch of commands, he actually drew a circle, and it's actually using that circle and the way that it's represented to actually um, perform the math. Um, so let's see. So there's a few other kind of um, interesting languages that, that are similar to Piet, where you're producing something that doesn't look like code at all, but um, is actually shaped by the program that you're trying to write with it. Um, Shakespeare, um, you write a, a Shakespeare play. The characters all have to have the names from real plays, but they're not characters that should really necessarily appear together, like um, you know, Romeo and Hamlet. Every scene has two characters, and the way they interact and how much they insult each other or compliment each other um, controls the way that data is copied back and forth. Um, Chef is a, is a program where, uh, this is only part of the Hello World program. Um, you can see that it's spelled Hello World if you look at the bottom, that haircut means the H, the, the X is E, uh, and going up. But um, yeah, so this leads to some very uh, um, atrocious recipes that come out of this. Um, I've never actually seen like an edible uh, Chef program. Um, I'm going to mention another one of my programs, which is Light Pattern, which really came out of, um, you know, with, with these languages, you know, the computer, something that's data, um, it doesn't have to sit in one file. There's no reason why a program has to be in, like, one text file. And just as these other programs have sort of broken out code into images, um, you know, anything that's sitting on your hard drive could be part of a program. Um, so, you know, I wrote this language where you give it a directory and it goes through all the JPEGs in alphabetical order 
And it looks at the EXIF data, and it looks at the image to see what the dominant color is. And uh, depending on changes between um, shutter speed and aperture from, and color from one image to the next, um, those get translated into commands. Um, but one thing I realized about this is that um, it's very hard to take pictures that, that write the program that you want. Uh, it's the same thing with, with like Piet and some of these other languages. It's like, you know, it's a lot of work to write a program that's actually going to run. So I built a machine. Uh, this is the one that's, that's sort of, this is the nice one that's still in progress um, with a, a filter wheel with a camera behind it. Um, but this is my prototype that actually works, <laughs> um, at least for now. And you can see what it does is um, it, it takes the pictures in the right order. So this will just keep um, making a Hello World program over and over again by just shooting whatever happens to be in front of it. Um, you can see it's, it's like on the verge of falling apart, the way it kind of whips around like that and the, the material, which is why I'm, I'm remaking it. But one thing I had in mind in working on this was work like John Hilliard's uh, camera recording its own condition, which emphasizes the camera as an apparatus that has no understanding of what's meaningful to people. Um, I mean, of course, the camera doesn't understand that a completely black image doesn't have, it, it's not legible to us. Um, the same way that a computer, when we're dealing with it at the code level, you know, writing code, it's, it's denotative. It, you're writing commands. Um, there's, there's no, you know, the computer doesn't care about nuance or gesture or anything else in the code. Like, we might do that for other programmers who are reading it later to understand what we mean. But the computer doesn't care, um, just as the camera doesn't really care. Um, but what happens is, when you have a camera, so I have the setup of my studio, and you can see, I took a lot of the same pictures, but what sort of became more interesting is when people, when I ask people to sit in front of it, when people have a camera sitting, like, uh, pointing at them, they either sit there uncomfortably, or they start performing for it, and just, like, making these kind of gestures or making faces at it. And for me, that sort of started to fill in some of this nuance and bodily gesture that sort of at the code level, um, we're not really able to do. Um, so you can see, this is, this is an old version of the program, which is why it's two digit numbers. But anyway, it's, um, this is building a Hello World program. Um, so one more, let's see, I think I'll skip this. Um, so OK, so I want to talk about um, a few languages that um, so, OK, so a programming language, you know, it's just a set of rules. It doesn't actually have to, to do anything besides define, define itself in some way. So this is a language called Callisti. Um, it was written by the, uh, the prophet wizard of the crayon cake and the seven-inch bread. Um, and you can see his, his kind of Discordian philosophy here. Um, you know, there's plenty of nothing. Everything is true. Everything is false. Um, so the thing about Callisti is that it accepts anything. Anything you give it is a working program. You know, you can give it like your resume. You can give it like photos that, that you know, uh, you can give it anything and it'll always say this is a working Callisti program. But because it doesn't reject anything, it doesn't actually produce anything from it. So everything successfully compiles, but no program actually comes out of it. Um, on the other hand, we have the program Unnecessary uh, by Keymaker. And Oh, anything to anything. Yeah, that's, that's um, EBNF notation. Um, it's kind of a description of the language in formal terms. Um, unnecessary um, is a language where all code is bad code. Um, no, matter what it gives, no matter what you give it, it'll, it'll fail. But if it can't find your program file, um, it'll succeed. And it'll compile into a program that has a single instruction that says uh, no operation, uh, don't do anything. Um, so one of the things about it, so every program it produces is a null program, but it's also what's called a Quine, which is a program that prints its own source code to the screen. Um, because there was no source code and it doesn't print anything, it's successfully um, printing its source code to the screen. Um, so that, uh, so I actually, I, I interviewed Keymaker for my blog about some of his languages, and, and um, the fact that this is a self-describing language was, was very important. Um, along the same lines, we have the language uh, white space which is um, completely made up of um, space, tab, and return. Um, it ignores anything else in the program. Um, so it's sort of the opposite of many languages that, that e there are many languages that ignore white space. It'll treat a, a space the same way as a tab. It doesn't really matter how you have it formatted on the page. So one of the nice things about white space 
is that you can actually hide a white space program in like a working C program. So you have your C program that you can see, and you have your hidden white space program that's in the same file. Um, you just have to use the other compiler. And you know, all of this sort of you know, builds on um, this. It's, it's the natural state of machines to not really care what the data looks like. It'll treat, you know, no matter what data you give it, um, it'll treat it as whatever you tell it it is. Um, OK, so this is a language called ALB um, by uh, Ramsey Nasser. Um, you know, he was really interested in kind of the Western dominance of, of programming norms and, and the way that nearly all languages are written in Roman scripts. So he, he wrote a language that um, you have to write in Arabic. Um, I think it's similar to Ruby. I think it's built on Ruby. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about that. But one of the nice things about it is that you can take working all programs and build mosaics out of it, um, building on like traditional Islamic design. Um, you, you know, you can build these, these patterns. This is one that was in progress. Unfortunately, I don't have a better picture of it, but um, this is a project he was working on at IBM. So I think that's pretty much all that I have. Um, this is the IRC channel, which is still pretty active um, for SLANGs, and the wiki that has um, pretty much every esoteric program, programming language on it. Um, and there's my information at the bottom. So if people have any questions, um, oh yeah, go ahead. So Acme Bleach, is, that, is there a language called Acme Bleach? Okay, that's interesting. I, I haven't, no. But um, that kind of reminds me that a lot of people consider Perl uh, an esoteric programming language because you can write stuff that's uh, like equally unreadable to a lot of the, the uh, languages here. Um, well, total, I mean, I think there's about 800 esoteric programming languages. Um, I mean, I've obviously looked at like a small fraction of those, um, but I do poke around randomly, and some of these ones, like Callisti, I found kind of randomly. Um, but yeah, I try to keep up with, with new languages and what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the way you use photos of these people, and these are the photos, and the picture of the color is like what you're using to program something. Yeah, what happens is the compiler just uh, it looks at um, what the dominant color is. Um, and it doesn't have to be so obvious. Like it doesn't have to be really red like it is in, in, in with, the, um, with the gel. Um, it, it only cares if there's, I mean, it really is just going pixel by pixel and looking at how, like, how much red is there, how much green is there, how much blue is there. So my question is really, like, so you're getting these photos, right? These uh -huh. photos are part of the piece, right? I'm assuming. But yes. Also, like, the code, like, what is the code and what is the other piece that is going to be controlled? Well, that was a Hello World program. So okay. it's, it just prints Hello World to the screen. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about other larger programs that I might build off of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm really rebuilding this thing to find a way of kind of doing an installation around this. So it's definitely something I have in mind, but I'm, I'm still working out um, what it's going to look like. Thanks. All right, great. Well, thanks, everybody.